Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the program. My name is William Hemsworth. It's great to be with you all again for today's show. Please welcome our guest back today, the author of The Love Driven Man, a Catholic author and speaker, Marek Rudak. R- Marek, how are you today? I am doing fantastic. Thank you so much for, for having me back. And I always enjoy talking to you. So, so thank, thank you so much again for the invitation. Oh, it's my pleasure. I know last time we talked about your book, uh, The Love Driven mm-hmm. Man, I'm doing really well. I'm really, I'm almost done with the book. I'm really enjoying it. So look for that review soon on the blog post. But I, oh, thank I, you. before we get into our topic today, which is servant leadership, mm-hmm. I understand there's some great news about your book. Can you share that with yeah. us? Yeah, yeah. It's the most random thing. You know, long story short, like one thing led to another, and um, this Catholic publishing company in Poland reached out to me, and they actually gave me a publishing contract. Uh, you know, which is which is a cool thing because I remember. When I was looking to publish the book in 2020, uh, whenever we reached out to publish, it was like cricket, cricket, or thanks, but no thanks. We'll, we'll keep you in our prayers. <laughs> you, you, you know, you know, you know the, you, you know the kind of the common rejections. And so, what's kind of nice thing that I didn't really seek it, and, and they reached out to me. And so, what's going to happen is they're going to translate it into Polish, and they're awesome. targeting to publish it for for Christmas. And so, um, and it, you know, it, it's very exciting. It'll be really curious to see how it is received in Poland, you know, because it's, you know, my experience is kind of spent both, uh, spent both Poland and, and United States, but it's mostly United States. So it'd be kind of a cool thing to see how uh, people in Poland relate to my experiences and, and, and hopefully, you know, um, they get some value out of it. So it'd be kind of interesting to see how, how they react to it and how helpful it is uh, going to be in their lives. That's exciting news. Um, so you have, oh, a, yeah. and as a self-publisher myself, and like, you know, you send stuff out, Mm-hmm. I remember one time getting a rejection within 12 hours. I'm like, can you at least think about it? I'm like, come on. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an auto response. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, that's, so that's great. Congratulations. And it's exciting uh, to have you. it, uh, have it in another language as well. So there must be some demand over there. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it also gave me an advance. So that that's very, that's a very nice thing. And yeah, it, it's a huge blessing. And It'll be interesting to see how how they translate it. And um, the cool thing is, in the contract, you know, they'll. Uh, I mean, they're, they're responsible for translating it, but they'll. Uh, I have to, I have the the right of, of approval. Sure. So I'm really looking forward to how they're gonna translate it in, in, into Polish because um, Polish is my first language, but I've never really talked about my faith or my feelings in Polish. So for me, it's kind of a new territory as well. So I'm looking forward to the experience. Well, great. So for listeners out there in Poland, I know there's a few of you out there. Look for that mm-hmm. around Christmas time. So check it yes, out. Yes, <laughs> please, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. So our topic today is servant leadership. And it, mm-hmm. it's a topic out, it's a topic really could affect every aspect of our life, not just one here or there. But can you give us a that maybe a definition of what serv- of what servant leadership is? Yeah, you know, th- that's a great one because I, I did a podcast with Catholic gentlemen and I get a lot of comments <laughs> on, on the on the uh, servant leadership portion. And it seems like there's a lot of misconception, especially from men, because, um, you know, based on the comments I got is that some men think that um, if they are servant leaders, then somehow they um, give up their authority as the head of the household, you know. Um, and, and so to me, that the best way to ex- explain servant leadership is to figure out is how can I best serve in this particular situation? And so sometimes that may uh, actually mean to enforce your boundaries. You know, for example, if you're being a pushover and somebody's taking advantage of it, the best way to be your servant in this situation is to enforce your boundaries and not let you, let that person do that. Uh, obviously, in a respectful way, but you know, <laughs> by no means being a servant means that you gotta be a pushover. And so, to me, the best way I think about servant leadership is like, how can I best serve in this particular situation? Okay. Now, you and I, we have military backgrounds. You went to West Point, you graduated mm-hmm. in the top 10% of your class. Oh, thank you. Um, was servant leadership something you were taught in the military as well? Yeah, it, 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 it always was kind of the golden standard. But unfortunately, my, my misconception of, of servant leadership, it was that it's, it's a nice to have, but results come first. And, and don't get me wrong, results are important. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of that, that, that kind of that short term versus long term. Yeah, you know, sometimes you got to grab somebody by the collar, pull, pull them up because you, you can't, you know, have that conversation where the bullets are flying. But to me, taking the time to really get to know the people, to, to really figure out how to best serve them is always the ideal. And, and that's something that should always be at the forefront of your mind. And um, and pulling, you know, and, and, and short, shortcutting that circuit and, and getting the results sometimes is necessary. 
But to me, like the way to make that really sustainable is, is by developing the relationship, which yes, but takes time. But over time, it's, it's, it's like an investment. It pays itself multiple, multiple times over to really spend the time and figure out is like, how can I best serve that person? And how can I use that person and their abilities to accomplish the mission? So it kind of sounds like servant leadership then is, well, in banking, we use the term relationship building, yeah. uh, where you try to get to know the person on yeah. a personal level, yeah. and then you adapt your, because everyone responds to leadership differently. Mm-hmm. So I guess, how would servant leadership help us mm-hmm. ident- identify um, different ways of how we have to lead? Yeah, sure. So I actually have some notes and I'm kind of, oh, you can see. But anyways, you know, I'm kind of like the person that I always try to like, you know, use that paper. So I kind of have, uh, you know, it's kind of little scribbles, but uh, it's, yeah. it should be enough for me to be able to read it. So what I did is I identified three areas. You know, one of them is God, which is up. The other one is inside, which is ourselves. And then the other one is outside. So so let, let's start with God. And, you know, and, and you know, please, please, Feel free to push back because I feel like there's a, there's a book brewing, so you know don't don't hesitate to challenge my ideas. Right. So each for each one of these areas, I kind of come up with two main ways to do it, and then at the end, hopefully, if time we we can talk about KPIs because you know obviously, at the end of the day, you gotta know if it's working or not, and if you need to make adjustments. So, sure. so you know the 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 first one, the most important one, is God because being a servant leader is hard. I mean, it's hard. I mean, yeah. obviously, the best example is is of servant leadership is Jesus, and even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, he was really hurting. He was sweating blood. I mean, like both me and you, I'm sure you know we we've had our tough situations as well as our listeners. But did it ever come to the point of sweating blood? And he was he was somebody who was fully man and fully God. And was still struggling to become the, the ultimate servant leader of, of them all. And, and it's hard. And so that's why we really need uh, God's uh, intercession when it comes to patience, courage, uh, um, and, and, and our ability to, to persist because it's hard. And so to me, like uh, when it comes to God, you know, the, the two main points that help me as a leader and help me to, to teach other people to become servant leaders is the first one is, is prayer. And what it comes down to is, you know, don't make perfect dealing with good. You got to start with where you are. So, you know, if it's, if you, you know, praying every other day, you know, try, try to, you know, grow your prayer life, do it every day. And sometimes what happens, we do have a prayer routine, but it, it becomes stale. It almost kind of becomes like a ritual, just kind of, you know, go through the motions. So if that's you, then figure out ways where you can, um, reignite your prayer life. Maybe it's, it's, you know, the beautiful thing about us as Catholics, we have so many different prayers, you know, we can go to adoration, we can pray the rosary, chapel, you know, you, you name it. There's, there's plenty of it. So yeah. just find something that you can be consistent with and, and, and try to grow it a little bit at a time and always figure out, hey, is this, is this prayer, is, is my prayer life bringing me closer to God? If yes, that's fantastic. Keep it up. But if not, or if you feel like you're ready for more, don't hesitate to change that up because, you know, to me, relationship with God is, is like your, it's like energy, you know, there's just no way we can, we can do it our own. I mean, we can't, but it's, you know, we can only go for so long. And so that's why it's very important to have that uh, constant communication with, with, with the Lord and, and making sure that it's consistent. So that's one thing. And the second thing that's, that's also very important in my mind is to really getting to know the scripture uh, because I'm a product of Catholic education. I, you know, in Poland, I always had religious classes. I went to a Catholic high school in the United States, fantastic education, but if you ask me about scripture, be like, uh, I mean, it's scripture. Like, well, you know, what do you want? You know, I just, I mean, I knew a lot of facts, but I just didn't know how it connected everything. So I think it's very important to really understand um, the story, the, the main themes. Obviously, you know, we, we, we all have our lives. We have all responsibilities. We, we might not have the time to become the PhDs, but, you know, let's not make perfect the enemy of good and figure out that backbone of the scripture to see how it connects. You know, for, so for, for me, was really helpful is taking Jeff Cavins's course, uh, you know, the Bible adventure series. But nowadays it's actually even, yes. even easier than ever. Now we have the, the podcast and much things that that podcast with Father Mike Schmitz is based on that, uh, you know, uh, Bible timeline. And, and you know, it's, it's obviously it's a good thing to read commentaries, reads about the saints, but, you know, we have to dig in into the scripture and we have to really have, be comfortable with it and really understand how it fits in. Because the beautiful thing about the scripture is that as you as you really get to know the scripture, you you find yourself in 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 those stories. You 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 know those those stories will become your stories, and and through those stories, you'll be in a much better position to have the strength to become the servant leader. So that's really the the first one. So it's God, 
and mo more specifically growing prayer life and getting to know the scripture. Well, what are your thoughts so far, Will? No, I think that's, I think that's a great point. I think with prayer and scripture, it's kind of like getting back to basics mm -hmm. because everything flows from God and we have to be connected through God. God gives us so much. And when we're connected with him, we're connected to his love, his mercy. Hopefully we can pass that on to others when we're, mm -hmm. you know, whether our families work, whatever the case is. So no great points. Thank you. Yeah. And it's another way to put it is like, you can't give what you don't have. And so if you don't have God inside of you, if you don't take that time to, to grow that relationship, it's very hard to, to do that to somebody else because people pick up on when you're being inauthentic. And so, you know, yeah. if you don't have it yourself, your efforts to give it to others will, will not go very far. Okay. Right. So that's God. And so the second one is insight. So, um, and in particular, you know, because what happens is that, you know, the, there's this saying, uh, lead yourself first, uh, you know, lead, lead by example. It's always a lot easier to, to be a leader if people get a sense from you that you, you, you're walking the talk. And I mean, obviously you, you've been in, in banking industry and, you know, obviously our listeners are, we're in all sorts of industries and we all know the difference between the leader who walks the talk and the leader who, who just talks the talk. And, you know, they, they give a great speech, but then you, you see them act and it's, you know, it's, it's like, you know, they came from a different galaxy. And so that's why it's important to, you know, I mean, we, we all understand we're not perfect. We're going to fall short, but we just got to keep uh, making the effort to become better. And so to me, that the two best ways to do that, most efficient ways to do that is number one is get curious when we become judgmental and, and, and journaling. And, and so what I mean, like get curious when you become judgmental. So for example, like with me, <laughs> Like when I was in corporate America, I used to be like really judgmental of the people that I thought were, you know, um, pol pol politicians who are like always presenting, you know, who are always like um, leading initiatives. And, you know, I was like, oh, man, these guys are just such, you know, kiss ups or whatnot. You know, and, and you know, I, I was being judgmental. But, you know, like now knowing what I know now, in reality, I was envious because I didn't have the courage to do the same thing. So instead of me trying to work through like, like what's preventing me to do the same, it was easier for me to point the finger. And so that's why it's very helpful to like, whenever you get judgmental, you know, think about it's like, you know, what, what does this judgment say about me? Because that would be a, a huge hint into what's getting in the way of you becoming servant leader. So that's getting to know yourself, uh, you know, and, and more specifically understanding like your, your, your judgment response and where it comes from. And the second one that's, that's very important is, is journaling spending you know even if it's five to ten minutes every day just just writing down your thoughts because you know um and, and this is something that i really recommend a lot uh, as i do executive coaching and everybody who's tried it you know they you know they, they really um found it super helpful is because the thing about our thoughts it's scientific that our negative thoughts have four times as much charge as positive thoughts and so you can do ten thousand things right and you did the one thing wrong and that's like what you focus on so like right. journaling is a good way to get things out of your system and another beautiful thing about journaling is, I mean, I've been doing journaling for like, oh my goodness, at least eight years, maybe even 10 years. Uh, and it's kind of a cool thing to actually go back some years back and you realize just how much you've grown. Because like we, again, like we always focus on the negative. It's, it's yeah. a lot of times we feel like, hey, we're stuck. We're not making any progress. But it's like, when you look at your journal entries from a few years back, you're like, oh my goodness, this is what I used to think. And it's just amazing to be able to appreciate that growth. And it's so that's one thing it helps you appreciate the growth, but it's also a good way to uh, get things out of your system, process them in a healthy way, because you write it out. It's almost like it uses its grip because it's if in your mind, it will keeps bouncing, bouncing. And then when you write it out, it, it, you give it a, uh, you give a good pathway of, of these negative thoughts on, on the piece of paper. And it's kind of like a workout where the, the more you do it, the more resilient you become, the more aware of your thoughts you become, and the more you are in a position to be able to do something about it. And, and so, so what are your thoughts, Will? I feel like you're talking to me on these two. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see that journal, Will. <laughs> that's the thing. I haven't done it. And that mm -hmm. makes, it makes so much sense. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely need to start doing that. And like you said, with the, that last point, you can do 10,000 things right. But with that mm -hmm. one thing you do wrong, that's what you dwell on. And that's my wife. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. I'll obsess over and obsess over and it gets me down until something else happens. So definitely I got to start journaling. That's a great point. So thanks for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. And so like, for example, like, you know, like, you know, when you journal out about this, because a lot of times we like the things we don't understand or we, we um, 
control us. And so like when you write things out, you, you realize that it's not as bad as you think. And a lot of times the reason why you think it's so bad is because you don't want to think about it, you push it away. But when you l- spend the time to actually look into it, uh, write it out, get curious about it, you realize, man, what's, what's, what's really the big deal? And really the big deal was the fact that you just weren't willing to, to go in there. So I highly recommend it. Yeah. Some people do it on, on piece of paper. Like for example, me, I like to do it on a computer because I can, you know, search it. But either way, um, it's it's a great habit. Even if you do it for five minutes, you will see uh, results. So I highly, highly recommend it. Okay. And then so the third step is is outside, and it's basically what what I mean by outside is how you treat other people. And so for to me, that the kind of the two ways to kind of get your biggest uh, bang for the buck, you know, for your efforts is uh, number one, compliment people. And then the second one is volunteer. Now, complimenting is super important because it kind of, it goes again into the fact that we always focus on the negative. And so, you know, think, think about like when, when you get a compliment, it makes you feel good, right? It makes you feel appreciated. But, you know, the thing about it is even though we, we like it, we rarely ever do it, you know? So it's like, again, becoming a servant leader. It's, it's being proactive, taking that first step. And a lot of times what happens is nobody's willing to take that first step. And so nothing changes. And so if you... You know, there's there's this one quote by by Gandhi. You know, become the leader that that you wish you had uh, that you wish you had. And so, like, what what better way to to be a servant leader than demonstrate the very behaviors that you would like to see more of yourself? And the, the cool thing about it is is that it works both ways because when you compliment the, the person, it automatically wires you to be more cognizant on, of other people's good behaviors. And so, you see more good behaviors, you you feel better. You, you compliment more people, they'll compliment you and it, it just starts that, that virtual cycle. Now, I don't mean about fake compliments. <laughs> you know, I, I don't mean to be, you know, manipulative, but I mean, let's be honest. There's always something that somebody does right. And it's all it is, is just taking the time to notice it. And it's a small thing, but it has a tremendous impact on, on people around you and your ability to become a leader because you essentially big, build up that trust bank. And the more, the bigger your trust bank is, the easier is for you to uh, get things done with the person, the easier is for that person to approach you and be like, Hey, Will, you, you're an amazing guy. Like, what's your secret? And then you can say, well, you know, there's this guy, Jesus Christ, blah, 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 blah. So, so that's, uh, that's, you know, complimenting and volunteering. I really I recommend volunteering because when you volunteer, you really, um, it, it's a great opportunity to really get to know yourself, you know, because, you know, like um, the things that you're willing to do for free say a lot about what you're passionate about, you know? And so like, I, I know that we all have day jobs. We sometimes might not be able to um, do ministry full-time and I totally get it, sure. but I, I still encourage you to, to find something that you can volunteer. Um, I'll give you an example. For example, like one thing that I volunteered was uh, uh, Life Team. You know, I, I, for those of you who don't know Life Team, it's basically, um, it's an organization. Basically, basically what happens is you get with high school students after mass and they have this, this kind of like a prepared program and then what I did specifically, I just, I was a, 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 a small group facilitator. And, and to me, I was like, man, it's, that would be, that would be kind of a, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I, at first I was scared a little bit because I'm, I don't have any kids and, you know, you know, that age teenagers, you know, we've yeah. all been teenagers and obviously I, we, we can have a separate show, uh, show about it, but, you know, in that volunteering, it was a very humbling experience because all of a sudden, you know, it's not like you have a direct authority. Uh, it's, you really have to find ways to be able to, um, at least for me, to be able to, to reach those things. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of things to be said about that. But, you know, the beautiful thing about volunteering is that, you know, that's how you find out some of the talents you probably didn't know you had. And, you know, through volunteering, it will help you to, when you talk, when you see all these other people who, who, do, uh, who volunteer as well, it will really help you to lift yourself up. And it will be a good way to re energize yourself as, as, a, as a servant leader because you are walking the talk. You, you're not just, you know, doing, you're not just saying things. You're actually taking the time to volunteer right. and, and make a difference. And there's, there's, you know, especially in the Catholic Church, there's so many ways you can do it. You know, there's Knights of Columbus, you know, obviously with Knights of Columbus, you can go anywhere from full time to just volunteer at a fish fry. You know, I mean, there's just so many ways, you know, there's, there's, there's life team, there's all these different, you know, Catholic charities, man. They do so, so much fantastic work. So just find one thing that resonates with you, do it, and you'll be amazed how much you actually get out of it. And in the process, you, you'll you be able to, to practice those servant leadership skills and you have a really great time doing it. And, and oh, by the way, you make a big difference. Um, so those are the two things for, for outside is complimenting people 
and finding opportunities to to volunteer. I think volunteering is a big one. What, Mark, what, what would you say to those who say, I, I don't have the time to do any volunteering. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm just so busy with, you know, mm-hmm. family, whatever the case is, there's no time. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, that, that's the beautiful about the thing about volunteering. There's, there's a lot of different way things you can do and, and, and I get it. It's a commitment. And the last thing you want to do is commit yourself and then let people down. You know, that, that is, doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, but it's, you know, just think about like what it is that you like doing, like what, what is your gift, you know, for example, like, you know, some, some folks might even like numbers, they're good at numbers, you know, like these, all these organizations need ways with, with to help them with accounting, you know, that that's like one thing, um, you know, if you, um, for example, if, if you have kids do, doing life team, well, you know, they're already there, then yeah. they may, they may maybe join them. So, so, you know, there's, it's really hard to kind of talk in, 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 you know, in, in general, because there's a lot of differences to do it, but, you know, you know, again, don't make perfect enemy of good, just think about what you like. Look at the church bulletin, figure out like what, what's what, what's what's resonating to you, and I can guarantee you that if you reach out to that particular organization, you know, especially this day and age uh, after COVID, a lot of these donations dried up. They'd be more than happy to have you, even if it's like one hour a month, yep. and and you'll be amazed that like once you start doing it, you'll you'll enjoy it, and for you it'll actually be something that will help you uh, regen- re- get your energy back, rejuvenate yourself. And, uh, and, you know, don't make perfect in you of good. I'm sure that you can find something. And this doesn't mean that you have to do X amount of hours. It's just start doing something and whatever it is, it's going to be wonderful. And you never know, you may just fall in love with it and you want to do more and more and more and you call yeah. out the time yeah, to yeah. do it. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, it's, well, and, and I, I think that's, what's going to happen, but I, I, I didn't want to say it because, you know, sometimes, <laughs> you know, how our brain works, they always like, we always find excuses from right. doing something uncomfortable. They're like, well, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, I, I don't want to, you know, overcommit, you know, and it's, and it's like, you know, and it's one of those things, it's like, it's an act of love, you know, it's like, once you fall in love with something, it's, it becomes easier, you know? So just find something you enjoy. And if you fall in love with it, you, you'll, you'll make it work. Right. Now you talked about, you gave the example of life team. Like if you already have kids in life team, you're already mm-hmm. there. That's kind of how I got, I don't want to say roped him. That's how I started teaching um, religious education at my parish. My kids mm-hmm. were already there and they needed help. And I said, okay, I'll do it for this one year. That was mm-hmm. six years. That was six years ago and I'm still doing it. Mm-hmm. I just, I, I just love it. But I found yeah, yeah, something yeah. I'd love to do. So and I know that I know that you like apologetics and I'm telling you, like, you know, this is my opinion, but to me, witnessing to teens is like the most special forces commando thing to do in the Catholic church. You know, I think that that's yeah. the hardest, I, I hardest taught... group to evangelize. So if you, if you learn to do it and if you, if you, even if you're, if you can, if you just survive it, I'm telling you, it's gonna, it's gonna change the way you're going to be able to, to witness to other people. I mean, to me, it's like kind of like the, the most hardcore way to evangelize. And after that, you'll, you'll, you'll be ready to do anything. You, yeah. you'll, be, you'll be ready to do anything. And, and, and I, I just could, I can't recommend it highly enough. It, it does. It's, you know, it's definitely a test of patience, you know, test of servant leadership, but it, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Yeah. I taught sixth graders a couple of years ago and yeah. some of those questions were, they really made you think and they were they were really genuine that was the thing though mm-hmm. so they it really made you think and hopefully it made some difference with them but some of the questions you don't think about that the kids would yeah. have they actually have they're hearing them so mm-hmm. yeah 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 it's fantastic so so oh. how, how do we evaluate um oh, yes. our our successes with oh. these three steps funny you should say i have two two ways that i just came up with right now so i so these are the the, the, the things thing uh two things um so the first one is uh, you you start defining your success by other people's success. You know what I mean? So you know, typically we 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 are successful and get a job promotion, get a pay raise, you know, uh, become pregnant, you, you name it. Which is you know obviously not, not not bad things. But when you become servant leader, you actually start enjoying seeing people succeed. No, I, I don't want to say because your your, your efforts but because of the seeds that you planted, you know, and it could be any, anything, you know, as simple as, you know, for example, life team, like, you know, there was this, like, man, what did the life team? There was this, you know, what happens because I'm a guy that gave me all the football players and man, it was hard because I was like, you know, I, I kind of want to go to my army mode, but, but thank, thank God I didn't. I, I, I had the patience to persist. And I remember this one time and actually write in the book, 
how how the uh, one of the guys asked to uh, pray and i was like man this is going to be a disaster you know it's like you know be patient be patient but you know he he gave a very good beautiful prayer you know very beautiful player and you know the thing about it is that the following semester he was still you know himself but it just that that little glimpse that little glimpse i, I you know proved to me that there are seeds i don't know when they're going to start growing you know this genius you know the seeds in my heart didn't start growing my till my 30s yeah. you know so i don't know what, what it's going to be for him but I felt that joy that I, I, I played a small part in, in planting those seeds. And so, so that's, that's what I mean by, by success in others. It could be something as simple as like a, a teen who, who, who gave a beautiful prayer, which sounds so trivial, but when you experience it after what seemed like a, a semester of drought, it felt like a miracle. Uh, so that's one thing. And then, um, oh, and here's another one. Uh, when you become comfortable having... Uh, uncomfortable conversations, you know, and this kind of goes back to this common um, objection to server leadership. Oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a man, I'm a leader. I'm, I'm not a pushover. I, I can't afford to be a server leader. Well, here, 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 here's where it comes to server leadership is that, you know, and I, I like this one quote by Tim Ferriss, who basically said that your success in life directly correlates to how many uncomfortable conversations you're willing to have. You know, and that's, that's where, that's where server leadership comes into place because it's easy for us to say, Hey, this guy doesn't get it. This, this girl, you know, there's something wrong with her. You know, these guys are not as holy as I am. You know, you, you name it. But what I found is that when you have those uncomfortable conversations, nine times out of 10, you realize just how wrong you were, you know, because you, 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 you or myself uh, were working off something superficial, you know, something on the surface. And, you know, there's, there's this one set, I just, I just did this one leadership class last week, and this is a fantastic quote I heard, is that our brains want facts, and in absence of facts, we make up bad stories, you know? And so the thing about the, having those uncomfortable conversations is that, you know, until you have them, you are very likely, um, in, in my experience, nine times out of 10, making up a story that's, uh, that's a lot worse than it actually is. And so, because, and when you have those uncomfortable conversations, you find out the facts. And once you understand the facts, then uh, you are in a much better position to be that servant to figure out what to do. You know, for example, like, you know, a, a classic thing that happens is when you at work, when you find out that somebody's not performing, when you have that conversation, typically you realize that maybe somebody died in their family or something bad happened. And man, what a wonderful way to witness, you know, mm -hmm. what a wonderful way to, to actually acknowledge the person. And, and actually witness to the person. So, so to me, it's like, but the, the amount of those uncomfortable conversations that you're willing to have is, is a perfect KPI of you becoming a civil leader because you don't do what uh, the crowd does, which is you know, make a bad assumption and, and, and leave them behind. You actually go out to that person and find out what the truth is. And that truth typically is something that actually builds a relationship, a much deeper relationship because it's, it, it builds it on something deeper, on something true that you didn't know was inside of that person. Great. Now, how would, how would this play out with, say within our marriages and our families? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, what a perfect way to start is, is, is uh, you know, families, you know, for example, um, you know, I write this in, in a book. I, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, you know, when I first moved in with my wife, Jesse, um, you know, she's an animal lover. Uh, and you know, that's something that I learned to appreciate, uh, the, the, the longer I've been with her, but I remember, um, when I first uh, moved in here, I, you know, I have this like, um, recliner and then, and then what happened is, is I, I was working, like, you know, writing something. And then when I was done, I, you know, in the recliner, you, 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 you kind of slam that footrest when mm -hmm. you, when you're done. And then Jesse told me, it's like, well, be careful, honey, because I don't want you to hurt our cat, you know? And. And to me, it was like, well, the cat's nowhere near. Like to me, I, I took it um, as an insult. Like, you know, it's like, like, well, like the, my first reaction was like, well, you think I'm some kind of an animal abuser that, you know, I mean, I, I know that the cat's not here. So like, you know, why are you, why are you nitpicking at me? I, I mean, I didn't say it, but that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from. Sure. And, you know, for like the rest of the day, I was like, I was pretty upset. I kind of, you know, did the average man thing, which is go to the cave. And so like, you know, if this was my previous relationships, that would be something that would just, you know, eventually tear up our relationship because, you know, I have this mindset that, hey, you know, she, she, she thinks that I'm some kind of an animal abuser just goes downhill from there. But because I, I've learned my, 
through a lot of mistakes that, you know, this is not uh, what I want to do in, in my marriage. I, I, you know, I talked to her and yes, it was an awkward conversation, but in that conversation, uh, I realized that my wife, the reason why she's, she's really overprotective of their animals is because she didn't experience the, the, the kind of love in, in her family that she wanted to experience. And she got that love from her, from her animals when growing up. And so that's why she's very overprotective to me. And then, you know, and then I, I explained to her that, you know, it's like, you know, the, probably the reason why I made that connection to, to, to bed is because, you know, I grew up in a very critical household. And so to me, uh, I just got so used to being criticized. And, and every time I, I hear criticism, I, I became oversensitive. And, you know, here I am, you know, 30 years later, I'm, I'm at this still, you know, even though I'm better at it, it's still, it's still that, that initial reaction typically brings me back to my childhood home that, hey, this person is attacking me, you know? And so once we had that conversation, I better understood where, where my wife comes from animals when it comes to like animals. And then she better understood that like, like sometimes when I don't respond well to criticism because uh, I respond to that stress reaction rather than actually thinking through what was happening. And so because of that, you know, that, you know, that conversation actually deepened our relationship because we both found out that, you know, the stories we were making about the situations were, were actually 100, 100 times worse than actually were. And because we were willing to have those uh, uncomfortable conversation, our relationship deepened and our love deepened and it helped us to prevent uh, other arguments down the line. Great. Now, Marek, what, what's, what's next for you and your ministry? What do you do? What are you up to next? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, I, I'd be lying to you if I told you that I know exactly what I'm doing, you know, with the ministry, I'm just taking one step at a time. So I, I love collaborations, you know, like w w one thing that I wish Catholic church did more of is this kind of like grassroots collaborations. You know, obviously like at the high level, the kind of the quote unquote Catholic celebrities, they collaborate all the time, but it seems like it's kind of like the glass ceiling. And, and you know, and a lot of times we just assume that, hey, we can't do anything because we don't have the, the reach, the support, the resources, you know, whatever. And so like what my passion is now is to try to figure out like how to encourage those collaborations at the grassroots levels. And so well, one thing that I'm doing with uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, and the Santas is tomorrow we're doing a, a workshop on how to lead as a Catholic at a workplace. So, uh, you know, we got about 65 people signed up. So that's fantastic. Great. So we'll see how it goes. And if, if there's a positive reception, you know, my, my plan is to do it every month. You know, I, I do about hundred hours of executive coaching these days so I can do these workshops like that, but you know, it will interesting to see like how how the uh, how the public receives it and 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 um, you know because uh, the last thing we want to do is do things just to do things. We want to make sure that we're providing value. So that's one thing. And also like another thing I'm I'm I'm, I'm doing with uh, Andy Santis is we're doing a workshop on uh, how COVID impacted mass attendance, so we can talk about it and and, and figure out how to how we can get back to mass. Because the interesting thing is is that actually for me, COVID. Uh, helped me because up until COVID, I, I went to church, you know, for the obligatory, day, obligatory days. But uh, this past Lent, I made a commitment to go to daily mass every single day. And just like pretty much everything I've committed to do in Lent uh, afterwards, I was like, man, this is actually pretty good. You know, let me do some more. So nowadays, so nowadays if I don't have an appointment in the morning, I, I go to daily mass and, and actually enjoy it and actually enjoy it. And so, so, that's, so that's one thing we're going to work on. Is, is doing those workshops. Um, so those are, those are the kind of the two most immediate things. There's some other things, you know, kind of formulating in, in, in the front, but it's kind of too fuzzy yet to describe it, but, but really kind of in a nutshell, it's, it's just doing those, those grassroots collaborations because, you know, how amazing it would be if more people stepped up and found ways they can serve. And, you know, what I find, obviously we both appreciate from the military, it's always a lot easier to serve if, if you have like-minded people in your corner. And so- Absolutely. So I'm trying to figure out like how to do some leadership with collaborations to, to make an impact at the local level and, um, and not, you know, it's kind of like going back to that JFK quote. It's like, ask not what the church can do for you, but what you can do for your church, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> hey, it's so true. So where can our listeners get a hold of you and reach out to you if they have any questions or want to learn more about you? Yeah, sure. So the best thing to do is uh, go to my website, which is marekrudak.com. It's all in one word. And then you'll you see you you find ways to to get a hold of me there, um, and also reach out to me on social media. You know, send, send me a Facebook request, LinkedIn request. I'd love to connect. I'd love to hear your ideas. And um, yeah, yeah, please, 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 definitely, definitely reach out. And also, if you if you're interested in my story, check out the book, The Love Driven Man. It's available on Amazon, on Kindle, paperback, as well as Audible. If you're listening, you can get it in Audible as well. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you for coming on and giving us some tips on servant leadership, something we all need to improve at. And thanks for all you're doing out there. God bless you. Oh, thank you so much, Will. And uh, looking forward to connecting soon. All right. Take care.